My name is Sol Flores, and I'm going to be your moderator for this evening. Um, esta noche nosotros vamos a tener servicios de traducción en español. Si ustedes lo necesiten, ten, ne, tenemos equipo aquí y también si necesitan alguien para traducir aquí en el micrófono, tenemos una muchacha que se llama Susie. Susie, can you wave your hand, please? Y esta señorita podría hacer uh, la traducción también. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I know that you could be anywhere. You could be with your families, doing the things that are important to you, and you chose to make your presence here tonight because you care about this city. You care about young people, and you care about families. And tonight is an opportunity for you to share your concerns, your questions, and also, most importantly, your solutions and ideas. I'm going to share a little bit about how tonight's going to go. We're going to have a brief presentation from the chairwoman of the Police Accountability Task Force. She's going to introduce what the role of the task force is. And then we're going to open up the evening for your questions, your comments, your thoughts. How can you come and talk? You can do two things. You can fill out a card, and you can say, I would like to speak at the microphone. It, it says it on here, you can indicate, I will call your name and you can come to the microphone. If you would like to make a comment but you don't want to speak publicly, you can still write it on here, you can write your comment on the back, and then I will read your comment here from the microphone. I'm going to remind you again at the end of the evening that this isn't the only way that you can make comments and provide input. There are numerous electronic digital ways, as well as an additional forum meeting, as well as access directly to the, to the task force members. I'd like to remind you all tonight, uh, oh, just sorry, one, uh, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we do have a timekeeper. Um, her name is, up, her, she's up here, Hope. Hope, raise your, raise your hand. And Hope is going to help me keep time tonight. When you come to the microphone to give your comment, you'll have two minutes. And we ask that you please respect that because there's many of us here tonight and we want to hear from as many people as possible. I also want to ask for forgiveness if I accidentally pronounce your name incorrectly. Sometimes I have a hard time reading handwriting. Just want to let you know I do respect your name and I apologize if I say your name incorrectly. I also want to remind that we be respectful of each other, we be respectful of the task members and everyone that's here tonight. We're here to share and engage. So with that, I would like to introduce for a welcome this evening uh, the principal of Benito Juarez Community Academy, Juan Carlos Ocon. Good evening and welcome to Benito Juarez Community Academy. We are the Eagles. And on behalf of our entire school community, um, we'd like to not only welcome you here, but really inform you that we are truly honored to be part of the many organizations that work together to put this together to make this possible. Muy buenas noches a todos y bienvenidos a la Escuela Comunitaria Benito Juarez, su casa. Um, aquí somos las águilas de las Juárez y para nosotros es un gran honor tener a todos ustedes aquí presente y tiene mucho sentido que estas organizaciones se unan aquí en la Juárez. Uh, les doy la bienvenida y uh, one more time just um, a hearty welcome from, from our entire school community. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now also offer a welcome and a hello from one of our many community organizations uh, here locally uh, coming to the stage to, to say hello uh, and welcome uh, is Maria Socorro Pesqueira from Mujeres Latinas en Acción. Thank you, Sol. Uh, gracias. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to give the first response. Um, trust 
uh, is important. Uh, and let me step back and say, um, as Sol mentioned, I'm Maria del Socorro Pesqueira with Mujeres Latinas in Acción, Latin Women Taking Action. And the work that we do on a day-to-day -day, uh, is with individuals, many of whom are survivors of domestic violence, rape victim survivors, as well as youth that are engaged in the community. They need to have trust. Es necesario tener confianza en nuestra, nuestra policía para seguir, um, tener una comunidad fuerte. And so I welcome everyone to uh, use this opportunity to allow uh, a dialogue and response to the task force report, uh, report and to allow for the opportunity that for our voices to be heard um, as trust and accountability is being created. Así que, por favor, utilicen este tiempo para que se escucha la voz sobre lo importante que es la confianza en nuestra comunidad. So thank you very much and welcome to the task force. I know this is um, information that is extremely important uh, not just to Mujer Latinas en Acción in the Pilsen community, but the entire city of Chicago. So thank you very much to the task force for making this report. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Maria. Again, if you're interested in making a comment or having a comment read, please complete the cards. <clears throat> I would like to now introduce the Chairwoman of the Police Accountability Task Force, Lori Lightfoot. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we very much appreciate you coming out tonight, um, and hopefully we will have a very interesting and informative discussion uh, with you. It's very important that we hear from members of the community. Um, as was stated, this is our third uh, uh, four forums that we're having all over the city. As part of our community engagement strategy uh, for the Police Accountability Task Force. There are many ways, though, that you can engage with us aside from offering up your comments and your thoughts uh, in this kind of a forum. Um, we have a, a website, uh, chicagopatf.org. Um, there are many ways in which you can get engaged. You can register to get alerts. You can offer us comments. You can send us a letter, the old-fashioned way. We, on their website uh, is our post office box. Um, or we have staff throughout the room. Um, and if you uh, don't feel comfortable standing up and giving a comment, or you don't want your comments specifically read, we still encourage you to let us hear from you, um, because we take uh, in serious consideration all comments that we receive from members of the community. Uh, we've reached out and heard from hundreds of people at this point, and we hope to hear from many, many more citizens uh, who have specific experience with or opinions about uh, policing here in Chicago. Again, it's very important that we hear from you, and we, and we are very happy uh, that you've come out here tonight. As you, many of you know, this task force was formed uh, in early December, um, right after the release of the Laquan McDonald video. We have um, set about our work um, by organizing ourselves in working groups around five specific areas, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but we have, uh, it's our mission both to find out what the circumstances are here on the ground, um, practices and procedures within the police department and the independent police review authority and other uh, parts of uh, city government that have an impact on police accountability. So if you have any thoughts or, or specific comments about any of those areas, we definitely want to hear from you. Let me introduce the, the other men, members of the panel, and then we'll come back and talk to you specifically about the five subject matter areas that we are, are looking at. Um, to my immediate left is uh, Sergio Acosta, and I'll let Sergio uh, introduce himself to you. Buenas noches. Uh, my name is Sergio Acosta. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, task force uh, very happy to be here this evening. Uh, we are, as Lori mentioned, very interested in getting uh, your ideas, your thoughts about how to improve the relations between the police and the community. Uh, queremos escuchar no solo sus quejas, pero más importante, sus ideas. ¿Qué es lo que ustedes piensan que podemos hacer aquí en Chicago para mejorar las relaciones entre la policía 
y la comunidad. I look forward to your comments here this evening. Thank you. Randall Stone. Good evening. Um, my working group is uh, concerned with community relations, community and police relations. And we're looking at a number of areas in our group. Uh, we have a large working group of about 20 members representing people from a variety of walks of life. And we're looking at accountability, we're looking at racism, we're looking at training, we're looking at community policing, and we're looking at respecting human and civil rights. And those are the areas that our working group is going to be focused on. And I'm looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Victor Dixon. Good evening. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. My name is Victor Dixon, and I'm going to be assisting um, Randolph with the Community Police Relations uh, Working Group. And we are uh, very much interested in your thoughts and uh, really uh, taking careful notes up here and plan on using your input in, in our recommendations. So thank you very much for your honesty and for your participation. Joe Ferguson. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for being here um, and welcome. This is incredibly important um, that we all hear from you, not just your experiences, but your ideas for what we should be focusing on uh, for solutions to the challenges that we know we all face. I'm the Inspector General for the City of Chicago, task force member, and uh, a member of the Legal Oversight and Accountability Group that is specifically looking at uh, the overall structural and legal issues, including obstacles uh, for making sure that when something goes wrong, when an officer's conduct veers from what we all know it should be, that there are the proper mechanisms in place to um, bring accountability to that situation. Um, and uh, uh, so thank you very much again for being here, and I'll turn it back to Lori to describe the work in more detail. One, one other person that I want to introduce before I get into the specifics about the task force work um, is uh, former Go Massachusetts Governor DeBall Patrick, a uh, Chicago native who's been an incredible support for the work of the task force from day one and serves as our senior advisor. Governor Patrick. Now, you've heard about two of the working groups, and that is uh, community relations and engagement uh, and legal oversight. There are three um, other uh, working groups that uh, we have organized ourselves around. Um, one is um, de-escalation, um, and that is looking at the way in which police officers engage with the public, particularly in circumstances where um, they are volatile, a person might be in crisis, uh, or suffering some from some kind of mental illness. We're looking at the whole chain um, that flows from the time that a 911 call, call comes in uh, to the time that uh, police officers are dispatched, or if they encounter somebody on the street. Specifically, what is their training? Um, are they trained in a way that uh, puts them in the best position to use that training, their, their judgment, and their assessment of the circumstance to engage with uh, a community member that might be in need of services, but do it in a way that um, is, uses the least or no force. The other area that uh, we're looking at is early intervention and personnel concerns. And that is, uh, we are looking at ways in which we can make recommendations to the city and the police department in particular about setting up a system that flags uh, problematic behavior on the part of officers so that an intervention can be designed um, and, in, in, and an intervention can happen at the earliest possible point to put that officer back on the right track or, if not, manage them out of the department. Um, and the final working group um, is the uh, video release policy. Some of you may have read last week um, that that working group uh, released uh, its initial recommendations. Um, and there what we're looking at is striking the right balance between your interest and in knowing about what happened when there's a serious police action. Uh, and I'll take, for example, a police-involved shooting where a citizen is struck or killed. 
um, knowing what happened and particularly being able to see uh, videotape uh, evidence at the earliest possible um, time, balancing that interest with um, the city and the governmental interest in conducting an investigation um, that isn't compromised by early release of the video. Uh, we recommended that that time period be 60 days, um, but we also encourage the city uh, to look um, at that policy within one year, if not sooner, to see if that time period of 60 days for the release of video, audio, and other related uh, information can be shortened from the, the 60 days that we recommended. Um, now I think it's important to, to hear from you. So I'm going to turn this back over to Saul. Thank you, Lori. Uh, just as a reminder, I'm going to call your name, and if you said you'd like to speak at the podium, you'll come and the podium is right here in the middle, the microphone is on. I will give you a 15 second warning and then I will let you know that your time is up so that we can hear from others in the audience tonight. And while folks are making their way to the podium after I call their name, I will also read comments from individuals who uh, do not want to speak but they wanted their comments heard. So to get started, I'd like to please welcome Mr. Lannon Broughton to the microphone, Mr. Lannon Broughton. And Mr. Broughton, as you're getting there, I'm going to read a comment from Mr. Carl Tutt. And uh, that comment is, as a member of 100 black men of Chicago, we believe there should be involvement by the community to help provide solutions with the Police Accountability Task Force. How can 100 black men of Chicago participate with you? Well, the, the, the gentleman that had the comment, we will make sure that we are um, in touch with you, and if you <laughs> wait after the forum, uh, we'll talk about ways in which we can in engage you in our process. Thank good you. Evening, sir. Okay, good, good afternoon, and we welcome you all here. Uh, my question and comment, you know, is probably in two parts. First of all, as far as with the community engagement and task force, you know, I would like to know, uh, would the Chicago police be more involved in uh, restorative justice policies like opening up more peace centers and peace houses within the neighborhoods. You know, we had, a, you know, I'm a part of Power Pack, Parents Organized Wing, Educating Renewed Policy Action Council, and one of, of our uh, projects that we're working on, we have opened up peace centers in, you know, several Chicago high schools, but then some of them got closed for funding, but we have found out that they were very effective in the escalating problems, you know, within the school. And at the same time, with the restorative justice policies, you know, uh, that can be de-escalating the policy, I mean, you know, help with the de-escalation, you know, within the streets. You know, with a peace house in, in a neighborhood, it will open up the doors, you know, for communication between the police and the residents of the, of the community. And mainly, you know, everybody talk about community policing. Can't nobody police a community better than a community. You know, the police can come in and they can do all the things, but the people, the residents of the community will constantly stay in that community and their eyes are open 24-7. So, you know, as far as, far as you know, uh, opening up more, you know, you know, diverting more resources into uh, restorative justice policies, you know, I think that would be one way to, you know, even, you know, eliminate some of the problems to be escalated, you know, throughout the police. And one other comment about uh, the, you know, intervention with the police, you know, me personally, I take it offensive to hear that because I think the police should be held to the same standards that they hold in the community. Once, if, if a person messes up in a community, the police 15 take, seconds, Mr. Bratton. If a person messes up in a community, they take them straight to jail. So why can't that police officer lose his job? Thank you. Thank you. And Thank let, you for your comments, sir. You want to go? Uh, yeah, just briefly. Um, the restorative justice point, I think that's an excellent point. There are a couple people in my working group that are restorative justice practitioners, and we're trying to figure out ways in which we can expand that process. Last night, I attended a peace circle at Precious Blood Ministries with a group of African American and Latino youth at a peace circle. And so we're definitely, I'm definitely looking at restorative justice as a way in which community policing can, can be u utilized. So I appreciate your comment.
Can you can you speak, sir, into the microphone? Well, it was turned off. Okay. Uh, if you Thursday night, you know, the six district police officer and a youth at the uh, at a peace house in the West Englewood Peace House, we'll be speaking together to find out, you know, try to work together. You know, you're more than welcome to come out. You know, I can get you the information. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. Thank you, sir. I'm going to read the next comment, and I'm going to ask Ms. Rosalva Nava to make her way to the microphone. Ms. Rosalva Nava. The next comment is from Ivan Salgado. Thank you, Chicago Police Department and every other law enforcement agency for all your hard work and dedication. Ms. Nava. Um, thank you for letting me have this opportunity. Like I said, uh, my name is Rosalva Nava. I am a mother of four, uh, two which are still in the Chicago public schools. I am a parent and also a peacemaker at Wells High School. And I represent Pow Power Pack and Kofi. I mean, Power Pack, which stands for Parents Who Organize to Win, Educate, and Renew Policy Action Council. We are parents, grandparents, Latinos, and African Americans working out through the whole city of Chicago, citywide, to better our neighborhoods, to make it safe for our kids. We, as Power Pack, have always been working with Restorative Justice in 2004 to stop the school to prison pipeline, to improve the school discipline by reducing the infective infectedness and the harsh punishment and by promoting the positive alternative like restorative justice or with the philosophy of restorative practice. We know that we are here focusing on the police abuse, the interactions within our, our streets. From our experience, working with the children, the children in the school are the first ones who are interacting with the police. At Wiles High School, there were many incidents. Since we first started our Peace Center in 2009 and continue working our, our Peace Center, we had one occasion where there was an altercation where students were fighting, a group of, of students, where police was called. And at that moment, instead of de-escalating the situation, it was worsened. It was worsened because the police officer didn't know how to de-escalate the situation by yelling at the student, telling them that they had the power to put 15 them in seconds, jail. Ms. Nava. We offer here, we as Power Pack have recommendations that we found that are very effective. Visiting Denver and knowing how they use the restorative practices with the police, the community, and in schools, and how efficiently this is. We recommend that this task force does these changes because at the end of the day, the kids are being handcuffed and being pushed out of our schools straight into the school pipeline. Thank you, Ms. Nava, you. for your comment. Ma'am, can I just say that you, you indicated that you have some specific recommendations for us. If you do, can you make sure that uh, one of our staff people gets them? Thank you. I'm gonna now uh, ask Ms. Uh, Kene, or K Mr. Kene Martin, I'm sorry if I didn't get that right, Kene Martin to make their way to the microphone. And as uh, they are making their way to the microphone, I'm going to read a comment from Mr. T.C. McCoy. The comment is, will we have to file for a freedom of information to get a full report of this accountability task force? No, you will not. And let me just, let me just add, um, when we finish our work, um, and we expect to have that finished by March 31st, we will specifically be making um, a public announcement of that work. We will be uh, preparing a written document um, that will be available. Um, we'll be working, for example, to help uh, get that distributed through uh, the public libraries um, and other uh, uh, community centers in the neighborhoods um, so that folks all over the city can see uh, the work product that we've created, and frankly, I hope that you will see your voices reflected uh, throughout that rep report. It's already very much informed the work that we've done so far, um, and I, I hope that you will um, take the opportunity uh, to look and examine and then, frankly, provide us with additional feedback um, after the final report is complete. Thank you, Good Laurie. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you guys. Um, there's an issue I have regarding the unmarked cars. Um, if you truly have nothing to hide, why aren't there dash cams in those? Why aren't the officers wearing cameras? You know, that's where a lot of your issues start from. The unmarked cars, they do what they want. There's no accountability, they don't care. I live on the north side and I sit back and watch targeting blacks. And if you have a hoodie, you know, they stop you just because. What is that about? You know, I mean, why should you feel guilty walking around in your neighborhood? It's very obvious what's going on. And you guys know what's going on. You know, I don't have to tell anybody what's happening. You know, these unmarked cars and trucks, what's the purpose? You know, there's, you know, there's no accountability there whatsoever. I even had an a issue with that. I was going to the store. I seen the officer circling around the neighborhood. Ten minutes later, he stopped me. Oh, we got a call. I didn't call you. Why are you coming to me? You know, oh, we had a call. You know, I mean, the same old lie. You know, this, <laughs> this is not new to Chicago. If you're really going to fix this and you're really serious, fix it. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you, Mr. Martin. I'd like to have Mr. Steve Craig make his way to the microphone. And as he's coming, I'm going to read a comment from Mr. Sergio Medina. The comment is, why is the task force not investigating the mayor in the case of Laquan McDonald? Why do we still not have independent oversight of the police as other places do? Good evening, sir. OK. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm going to question this process once again. This is coming down from the top. This is appointed by the mayor. All the power is in the mayor's office here. The power is not with the people. The people need the power to hold the police accountable. They need to have uh, democratically elected council members in a civilian police accountability council to hold the police accountable. This, this is all advisory. It's going to wind up on the mayor's desk and he's going to throw it in the outbox. The only person he answers to is his corporate buddies. You know, we're talking about community control. They're, they're talking about an image problem. We can see the mayor's got no clothes, man. He's got no suit of clothes. Everybody can see through that. It's time to give the people the power and uh, give it to the communities. We're talking about real physical crimes, police crimes. This is, these are the crimes that we documented in our letter to the Department of Justice that we've sent to them uh, for over two years now. We're finally getting quiet answers from them. They're finally, when, once the Laquan McDonald video came out and it's clear that the mayor's complicit in the cover-up, then the Justice Department sneaks, sneaks in and says, well, maybe there's a problem here. You know, it's, and the mayor's treating it like an image problem. It's not an image problem, it's a real crime problem. People are being brutalized in Chicago's communities, and the only way to hold them accountable is to give the communities the power to investigate and hold police accountable in the districts, in their neighborhoods. Hay que dar el poder a la gente en los barrios. Thank you, Mr. Thank Craig. You, I'd like to remind you that if you want to make a comment and speak at the microphone, or if you'd like to have your comment read, you can choose to have your comment read with or without your name. Just fill out a card, hold it up, and a staff member will um, get your card from you. I'd like to now call Mr. Mike Elliott. Good evening. Good evening, sir. So, we find ourselves here again facing a task force of, of people who made up of people who are handpicked by the mayor. Uh, the mayor has handpicked other task force. He handpicked the task force to oversee the hearings in communities about the school closings. And we know the results of that. He handpicked uh, the members of IPRA, the police board, and the, and the internal affairs division. And we know that the police uh, don't find police guilty of any crimes. So our problem has continued to grow because we have the police policing the police. 
the only, the only real chance that we have of changing this around is to have community involvement. There's nobody up there representing our community. Yeah. Nobody. And we need to have community involvement. We need to have a, an elected Civilian Police Accountability Council that will have the citizens, grant the citizens and the residents of Chicago the power to investigate um, and call for subpoenas against, against police who commit crimes in our communities. It's the only solution because otherwise we're going to continue with these task force that at the end of the day we'll get all of these recommendations and all of this, collect all this information and then put it on the desk of a man who uh, sat on the Laquan McDonald video for 400 days. And we want him to make a decision about uh, how, how policing is going to happen in this city. We know, we know the results. 15 seconds, Mr. Elliott. And so, uh, you know, it's not a personal attack on, all, on any of you, but you are all pawns in this game. And you have no effect on what's going to happen in this city with policing. And this is, I, I consider this a fraud. You, do, you are not a legitimate body. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. Well, I'm reading the next. I'd like to uh, address Mr. Elliott's comments because I think that they resonated with some earlier points. Um, with due respect, sir, all of us are members of the community. We live in Chicago. Many of us have been here for decades. We raise our children here. And we are up here tonight, and we have been doing this work over the last few months, and we will continue to do so because we care about our city and because we're interested and we believe that this time, in this climate, that we actually have the opportunity to make a difference. Now, again, you shake your head, and I, I respect that, sir, but the proof will be in the pudding, as the saying goes. And I invite you to measure our credibility, measure our work, measure our effectiveness by the report that we produce. I feel confident that we are going to say things in that report regarding our findings and observations about a range of topics that probably haven't ever been talked about before and certainly not put down in writing. And as for whether or not what we do will have any meaning beyond uh, the issuance of the report on March 31st, you all have the power to make a difference in that. The report goes not only to the mayor, the report also goes to the elected aldermen. And just as there have been citizens from all over the city that have marched in the streets and demanded change, which frankly is a, a big part of why we are here, you all have the power to organize, to lift your voices, to make your feelings known. And if you believe that there are things that we recommend that make sense, that, are, that, that will add value, that will change um, the level of accountability and transparency and trust between the police department and the community that they serve, you have every opportunity, just as we do, to raise your voice and let it be known that you expect there to be change. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask Mr. Edward Presnowski to please come to the podium. Mr. Presnowski, while you're coming, I'm going to read a comment. One plan to improve community relations is to hire more minority police officers, yet they are less likely to be promoted and more likely to be reprimanded. So how will this help community relations if the culture of the police department does not change? Mr. Presnowski. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Good evening, sir. I'm Edward Prasnowski. I am a retired Chicago police sergeant with over 22 years in the job. If this panel is truly interested in accountability and transparency, I would like you to answer a question and conduct an investigation. Eleven months ago at 26th Street, I was confronted by a certain sergeant who committed a criminal act against me. I went to a district station seeking a complaint against him was denied by a desk sergeant or lieutenant, found my way to IPRA, who listened to me, took my complaint, forwarded it to the IAD, and the subject was investigated by his former sergeant when he was a detective. I gave a video, audio tape, tape statement at IAD to a sergeant, who later I found out to be a board member, fellow board member, at the Chicago Police Sergeants Association. So where's the cover-up? 
And now this sergeant who committed this act against me is on the superintendent's promotional list to lieutenant meritoriously? Could you explain that to me? And I would cherish the moment after this panel is done so I could identify this department member to you. Because if he cannot conduct himself, how is he going to supervise 250 other police officers under his command when he's made a lieutenant and a watch commander in a district? I've gone to IPRA. A CR number was initiated. I've gone and filed a case report, a criminal case report against him. Both have ended up in the garbage. Last week I went to IPRA again. They suggested I go to the police board. On February 16th I went to the police board. I was told the president was not available. I spoke to Mr. Max Caproni. Here I who, am, sir. Who is the I, executive I, I, director who ignored me. Is this a cover-up because this subject is politically affiliated? with the previous mayoral administration? Sir, I'd be happy to speak with you after the, the meeting. And Thank again, you. raise your hand, uh, one of the staff people, so we can get your specific information so we can follow up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Presnaski. I'd like to ask Mr. Javier Ruiz to come to the podium. And as Mr. Ruiz comes, I'm going to read a comment. Police misconduct is costing the taxpayers millions of dollars. What steps are you taking to hold those officers accountable? Many of our poor communities are over-policed, but at the same time, when things happen and one calls the police, the response is slow. What can be done to improve the response time when crimes are taking place? There has been multiple articles showing the arrest disparities in communities of color for DUIs and drug arrests, but statistics show whites have higher rates of, of both drugs and DUIs. What will be done about policing equally? Thank you. Mr. Ruiz? Okay. I want to come up here and lend my support for an elected, uh, civilian police elected uh, board because, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, even if you just have good intentions, you know, you guys are at the end of the day appointed by Rom, and, you know, that's going to be your boss at the end of the day. So, you know, and my part two of the question is, how can we trust that you guys are going to be an independent voice for police accountability when you guys are, you know, clearly appointed by the mayor? You know, so we want to, so I guess to, to clarify to my final point, you know, we want to we wanna be able to trust this board that they're going to be an independent voice. But, you know, the fact that they're appointed by the mayor kind of sets off a red flag. So how can we trust that you're, you're going to do the job? Can you tell me what you're going to do when we issue the report? What are you going to do with that report that will lay out the history, lay out the findings, lay out the analysis, and lay out the recommendations? Because I will tell you, at the point that the report is issued, the five of us are simply five citizens. What are you going to do at that point, empowered with the information that I promise you we will be coming forward with? March 31st, right? That's right. That is a question to everybody, because you are right. Nothing happens if this report lands on the desk and nobody knows about it. That's not going to happen. You're going to have it. Now you have it. Is anything going to change? Not unless you do something with it. And Ms. Lightfoot mentioned this report will be issued in a public setting. It will go not merely to the mayor, but to each of the aldermen. Almost no one in this room could ever find his or her way to the fifth floor of City Hall for a personal session with the mayor, but everyone in this room can find their way to the aldermanic office where in the ward where they live. So my question back to everyone else is, what are you going to do to vindicate the work that we promise we are going to deliver to you? Well, that's up to March 31st for us to see. So. That's right. That's right, and there's, there's no reason for you to trust any of us, but I'm telling you, the work is coming, and then it's up to you. Thank you, well, sir. Well, we'll see. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rees.
I'd like to ask Curly Coher. Mr. Curly. Good evening, and thank you for your time. Good evening, sir. Um, my name's Curly Cohen, and uh, I'm going to ask you to look at me, because I want you to see. Someone who's sick and damaged and hurting and poisoning. If we just take the years from December 4th, 1969, when Fred Hampton was assassinated with FBI and City Hall approval, and we go 46 years, we're not shocked but we're sickened by the videotape of what the police do. How could it be through the assassination of Fred Hampton? How could it be the assassination of Rudy Lozano? How could it be during the Burge torture years? How could it be 2,000 young people, more than 2,000 young people who've been murdered in the city and we haven't even looked at whether what hand the role the police have played in that. In the old days, they would pick me up and drop me off in another territory. Now they use social media. It's vicious, it's wrong. Human beings have a base. desire for justice, fairness, fairness, justice, we thrive on it. How can it be we take the most traumatized and brutalized youth and brutalize them more? We tell them to, we tell them to assume that- 15 seconds, Mr. Cohen. And then we put their hands on their butts sexual humiliation. We put them on their knees, hands on the squad car. 20 minutes, don't arrest them. Public humiliation. This is what we do to young people in the city of Chicago. I think we should disband the police department. I think they should be fired. If they want a job, they can put in an application. But based on less than four shots a week, we don't need armed police. If they have execution permits, why can't they have affordable housing permits? 9,244 people building 100 units of affordable second aid housing a Thank week. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, your time is up. I'd like to please ask Mr. Eric Russell. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eric Russell. Good evening. Hi. Good evening, sir. Hi, Madam Chairman. Uh, my name is Eric Russell, uh, Midwest Life, a social justice uh, activist, and also I'm the uh, spokesperson for the uh, Betty Jones family. Um, if many of you all don't know, uh, Betty Jones was the 55-year-old grandmother and mother of five who was executed by the Chicago police for simply opening her door. Um, and the first thing I always say is that Betty Jones did not deserve to die. But more so, but also what I want to say to my Hispanic and Latin brothers and sisters is that we have to unite against this reckless homicide. They are killing our women and children. They are killing our women and children. Pedro, Pedro Rios Jr., a 14-year-old kid, Pedro did not deserve to die. You think the Laquan McDonald video was bad. Wait till you see the Pedro Rios video. Uh, video. Pedro was a 14-year-old kid. They ran him over with a police car, 
And then as he lay there in the alley on the cement, the police get out and pump four bullets into a 14-year-old child. So I want to say to you is that the black and brown com uh, community, we need to unite against the police. It's going to get worse before it gets better. What we ask, Madam, Ch uh, Madam Chairman, is that we don't care a whole lot about, we want respectful engagement. But more so than that, because we have moved beyond systemic racism and institutional racism, we would ask Joseph that you only you at least put one thing in your report. 15 that seconds, Mr. Russell. We want you to put a reverence and a sanctity for our humanity. That's all we want. As victims is that what the media would not tell you about Betty Jones. Betty Jones is the Rosa Parks of this generation. They always try to make the worst out of victims. They, now they, they kill us, then they sue us. Now that's a, that's a whole new low. What, I, what they won't tell you about Betty Jones, Betty Jones had five children. But you know what the media won't tell you? All of her children was by one man. They always want to make us less. Let me tell you, Betty Jones was not Mr. Russell, when they did the talk. Mr. Russell, your time is Betty up. Jones. Mr. Russell, thank you. We have many comments we would like to get through this evening. Thank you, Mr. Russell. I'd like to please ask Mr. Jermaine Hudson. And while Jermaine is Hudson is making his way to the podium, I'd like to remind everyone that tonight is being videotaped and all of this information will be made available on the website along with the reports and information. It will all be available at patf.org. Mr. Jermaine Hudson. Uh, I'm a former uh, mil military uh, soldier. I served in Iraq and uh, I'm not sure if I'm the only one that feels this way, but I've always had an immense amount of respect and I've always been an advocate for law enforcement, particularly law, like local law enforcement, Chicago police. I've been home for a few years and I think I, everybody will agree with me. Like uh, a lot of the stuff that's going on is pretty disturbing to the gentleman that went before me, a couple of the other uh, folks that have asked questions. But um, my question is, coming into 2016, we saw, as you well know, uh, let me look at the numbers here. Uh, the number of shootings doubled as uh, in comparison to last year, January. Uh, murder was up 75 percent. I'm not sure how accurate those numbers are. I got them, you know, the news media, whatever. But uh, my question is, do you think it will ever become a time where the, the, the governor would have to uh, reactivate the National Guard? Do you think we'll ever get to that point? I mean, and the reason I ask that question is we're, we're heading into the summer. It's going to be a little bit more hot. It's going to get worse. I think we can all agree on that. There's going to be some more BS happening. And I'm not necessarily because the police have a hard job. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, and it actually it's a two-part question, do you, there seems to be more uh, emphasis in the body cameras and, and, and dashboard cameras, particularly because there's conflicting stories coming out from the police or witnesses. So if it, it seems to me, shouldn't there be more of an emphasis on like the ethics of like, like in training like, and, and, and bringing these police officers on board? I wouldn't want anyone to only trust me because I have a fucking camera, excuse me, a camera on my chest. I want you to trust me because I'm a police officer and I respect your word and must be true type of thing. So sort of a two-part question. If, if it open to anybody on the panel. Well, it's, it's, you sound like you've been following the news. You're, you're surely aware of the fact that the city has announced that it is expanding the number of officers who are going to be equipped with body cams. And frankly, I think that's a function of, of money and resources. But our expectation is that before too long, uh, any officer that's out there on the street responding to a call will not only have a body cam, but we're going to have actually fully operational dash cam videos as well, because we think that's, that's an important piece as well. Um, you know, we're not going to sit here and tell you that we have all the answers, but we think that there are some, definitely some things that are in process. The ethics uh, point that you made is, is absolutely something um, that we're very focused on. We're looking specifically at training that is done of new recruits, training that is done of pro promotional classes, um, and looking at 
not only are they being trained to fight crime, but are they being trained in a holistic way about respect for community, uh, about implicit bias that's in part of us. So those are all issues that really run across all the different working groups, and we are very much focused on that. So thank you for your comments, sir. Thank you, Laurie. Just as a reminder, if you would like to make a comment, have it read with or without your name, or make a comment from the microphone, please fill out a card. If you don't have a card, you can raise your hand, and a staff member with a yellow lanyard will come over and either pick up the card or provide you with a card. I'd like to read a comment now from Ms. Sandra Sosa. Our schools, from elementary and high school, have become mini satellite police stations started with officers that are not adequate, staffed with officers that are not adequately prepared to work with young people. We don't need police stations in our schools. We need teachers and caring adults. My proposition, when an officer is to be called to address a situation at a school, they should be extensively trained in de-escalation, youth development, and restorative justice practices. I'd like to have Mr. Byron Sigcho please come to the microphone. Uh, just, and before you speak, sir, um, folks that are standing in the back of the room, there are plenty of seats up front here or on the side. Why don't you have a seat? Mr. Byron. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm the director of the Pilsen Alliance. I'm a neighbor here in Pilsen. And uh, we, I think we echo some of the, the same messages that a lot of residents, especially from poor neighborhoods, African-American and Latino neighborhoods are saying. Um, you know, I, I, I think and I respect what the task force is trying to do, but I hope that you understand that uh, you are a little bit disconnected. And I think that um, we have to remember, and a lot of us uh, who have a consciousness, we have very clear what happened to La Juan McDonald, and we have not forgotten about that what a lot of, uh, even a police officer just have said here. And we gotta remember how we got to this point. And it was with task forces like this. Because that's what the mayor pretends to do and how he hides things from the public. So I think that the task force has one task. You have one task. And it's to tell the mayor that he cannot have his way. And he has, to advocate, and you have to advocate, to have an independent civil oversight body that holds our police department accountable. I think that's the simple task that you have. And I think any she's short of that will fail to accomplish what we're trying to do, which is to build trust between the community and the police department. But how can we build trust when we have no accountability on the police department side of it? So I hope that you echo, you know, and you heard the demands of the one of us that are not here with the mayor's office taking notes to see how they're going to reply to us. But you are actually here, listen to the community. And if you report talking about March, March 30th does not account for that and fails to take that testimony, you have failed as a task force. And you have failed all of us. Byron. So all we were saying here in the community is that anything short of that is a failure of this task force and there will be blood on your hands. Right. I'd like to ask Mr. David Sidzlowski. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, hearing what Mr. Ferguson said earlier, that you know, the, when we get the report, what do we do with it? It's a little insulting. The only reason we're here in the first place is because we got out and marched, because we fought to release the Laquan McDonald video. We brought you here, and yet we don't have any power. We can't meaningfully change the system as it currently exists. You know, there was a passage, we passed IPRA back in 2007. That hasn't changed anything. It certainly hasn't seen any results as we've seen with Rakia Boyd's murder. It certainly hasn't changed the results with Laquan McDonald. We need transparency and democracy. We need community control of the police. I guarantee you, you will not hear a single new idea tonight that you haven't heard already before and that you could not have heard by going out to any street corner in this neighborhood or many other neighborhoods in this city at any point in time. 
Just the same, I guarantee that we're not going to see anything new in your report that we don't already know, that we haven't read in the newspaper, that we haven't filed with the Department of Justice. Mr. Sigcho's right. All you have to do is give us the power and take it away from the mayor. That's the only thing that's going to make this better. Nothing less than that will work. Everything else in that will just be here in a few more years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sidlowski. Um, I'm going to read a comment from Kathy Cummings. How can 124 officers' bad criminal behavior be allowed to cost taxpayers millions and millions of dollars? Why are they allowed to be paid and stay on the force? Why? I'd like to ask Ms. Gwendolyn Chubb to please make her way to the microphone. Ms. Gwendolyn Chubb. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to it. It is, that is specifically something that we are examining and we will speak to, and that's specifically what mechanisms are in place to make sure that specific settlements and judgments against police officers as defended by the city are examined for the underlying conduct, are examined for the supervisory people around them that made that conduct possible, for the mechanisms that should have caught an early warning, uh, early warning signals, lesser grades of conduct before it got serious. All of these things are part of what it is that we are looking at. A situation in which you have settlement after settlement, judgment after judgment, costing people hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer money without consequence to those whose conduct resulted in those payouts, we all agree is unacceptable and it is something that we must meet in our report. Thank you, Inspector. Good evening, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm not sure which working groups I would address this to. I was thinking accountability. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, in 2013, I was going through a horrific divorce and custody trial with my ex-husband, and he told the police officer at my daughter's school that there was an order of protection against me, which there wasn't, which I have on my court docket that it was denied. Anyway, at my daughter's graduation, this officer, Brian Robinson, he actually put me out of the graduation facility without any paperwork or anything. I did call the police and I did try to get an uh, audio recording to present to uh, the board, but there's a process to it. Uh, I filed a complaint with IPRA. The officer called me and he said, Ms. Chubb, we will investigate, however, if the results of the investigation don't uh, turn out to be turn into criminal charges against Officer Brian Robinson, then we will charge you and we will also make you pay for the investigation by the Chicago police, which I later found out that was not true. So I filed a second complaint with IPRA against that officer. However, the only problem is neither one of the complaints were ever investigated or follow up, followed up on. So is it too late for me to refile those complaints? How do I uh, follow up on those? And if you, the board finds or IPRA finds that there was no order of protection, which there wasn't, Will that officer be charged with perjury? Am I allowed to sue him for defamation of character or sue the Chicago Police Department? What happens with that? Why is it just, you know, like they, they're allowed to just destroy you, destroy your life, your <laughs> reputation, impugn you, and nothing happens. So how do I follow up on that? And again, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Merrick. Ma'am. Ma'am. Yes, yes. Mr. Merrick will talk to you and give you information about next steps. Okay, can I please have Pat Hill come to the microphone? Pat Hill. Is there a Pat Hill? She's coming. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Hill. Thank you Hi. for coming Hi. again. Yeah, um, 
one more time after this. I'm here tonight to uh, make the record again. Um, I want to bring to your attention United States versus City of Chicago, Indy, Illinois, 1975. I want to bring to you the sections NOS period 73, C, 2080, 2220, 1252, 75, C, 79. I'll give somebody a copy if they want it. That is a lawsuit that was filed in 1971 by, the, by members of the Afro-American Patrolman's League in conjunction with Tadeo Robert Camacho. At that point, blacks and Latinos did unite. And they united because of the fact that the Chicago Police Department, City of Chicago, was discriminating in the hiring of black and Latino officers. If you really want to solve this problem, look at the facts. The facts are no Latino or black officers are killing black and Latino children. They are being killed by white officers. And the majority of the police department is white. So if you want to begin to resolve the problem, you got to go back to equalizing a department that is predominantly filled with people who kill black and Latino children. It's real simple. The lawsuit was successful. It stated, basically, let me tell you what the lawsuit is. Specifically, the administrative complaint alleged that the city was using federal funds it will receive to finance its police department, which in turn was guilty of racially discriminatory employment and promotion policies and practices. They lost it. The feds withheld revenue from this city because the first mayor there decided he didn't have to comply. We are reliving history. There was a saying, when you don't know your history, you repeat it. 15 seconds, Ms. Thank Hill. you, thank you. I will probably have to complete this at another time, but I'm doing it in a formal, open uh, forum because I don't want to do it in a clandestine closed meeting. There's a body of work that an organization called the Afro-American Patrolman's League has done that can help to resolve this problem, but they were never formally invited to sit on this task force. We don't really want to because we are going to do something with that document you talked about, Mr. Ferguson. And hopefully, we will all be joined in a lawsuit, one of the biggest they've ever seen, to finally put this baby to bed because we are losing our children. And we're losing them decade after decade after decade by descendants of those individuals who were hired in 1971. Thank we you, do Hill. have the power. And I suggest we begin to use it. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Hill. Uh, I'm going to read another comment and ask uh, uh, Mr. Giovanni Baez to make his way to the microphone. Uh, the comment is, what is being planned to better educate and train officers on the effects of trauma on individuals and the community? What is being planned to better educate and train officers to better interact and respond to residents with mental illness? Good evening, Mr. Bias. Good evening. <clears throat> so, um, as a recent graduate of Justice Studies. Sir, um, can I ask you just to speak directly into the microphone so that sure. everyone can hear as you? As a graduate of Justice Studies, um, there are a lot of problems within my city that I have grown and raised have been raised in that uh, is a problem to pretty much everybody. Um, oppression is engineered through poverty and poverty creates deviance in society. Um, that's just the obvious. There needs to be something that's fixed there because in order for there to be no violence and in order for cops to not have that uh, sense that they have to protect themselves at all times, um, deviance needs to be handled and in order to take care of that poverty needs to be taken away and um, we know this because we live through this every day uh, crime is committed every day um, but to be fair um, police have to respond to this crime every day also um, imagine a workload and danger that police go through every day we can't forget as humans that police are humans also even though that they are behind a badge, they do have a responsibility to protect and serve, although we most of the times don't feel that way. 
as a community, um, there are certain things that I would think that the mayor, for one, uh, needs to be held accountable. Um, he needs to be accountable for the crime because building a new Chicago isn't through gentrification. Uh, and last but not least, this isn't for um, the board or for mayor, I think this is mainly for the community, is that um, we need to reestablish the values of spending time with our families and actually sitting at the dinner table and eating together, talking, figuring out each other, and teaching the values of love, forgiveness, and respect. Because in order for us to ask for love, forgiveness, and respect, we need to know how to preach it and we need to know how to teach it also. And I strongly feel that if we can build some 15 some seconds, programs, Mr. Baez. If we can build some programs where the police and the community can come together and talk about the issues that are going around in the community, that it would establish a relationship between the cops and the community instead of having just a police society. Thank you, sir. Ms. Pamela Hunt. Just so that you're aware, after Pamela Hunt, we're going to have Mr. Albert Jackson. Thank you and good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Uh, this again. is my second address to the task force. And I do want to go on record and make some things really plain and clear. As I said, at the heart of this is racism. I stand by that. And if you're not trying to deal with that issue, everything else is going to fail. Let me talk about Rahm Emanuel. He needs to resign. And I call his office and I email him and I demand that he do so every day. Mr. Ferguson, I accept your challenge. As this gentleman stated, it is rather insulting because all of us are here for the purpose of exacting change. I accept your challenge as to what we will do after this report comes. Let me say something about Laquan McDonald so that everybody will be clear. There was no trace of PCP in his system. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because that was perpetrated in the media. No trace of PCP in his system. I'm, I'm concerned about the recommendation from the task force. You recommended that 60 days be allowed before releasing a, a police shooting video. Is that correct? That's correct. That is unacceptable. I don't know why you recommended 60 days, and I'm not surprised that Rahm Emanuel agreed to that because that gives him time to spin the story to get the record straight for maybe a dishonest police officers to engage in some falsifying of reports. There are other municipalities who release their reports in a more timely manner. As I understand it, there are some who even release them on YouTube or the internet 24 hours uh, after the shooting. 60 days, please revisit that, it's unacceptable. Lastly, let me say this, I always like to take it to the personal point. Rahm Emanuel wouldn't close 50 schools on Jewish children and families. He would know exactly what to do if these were Jewish young men being shot down like dogs. He would not have a problem with the response and also the correct action in taking these steps. When you shoot up Jewish people or do anything to Jewish people, it's anti-Semitism. You do it to women, it's called misogynistic behavior, violence against women, sexism. You do it to any other... seconds, Ms. Hunt. Sure. You do it to gay, lesbian uh, community, it's called homophobia. Well, when you do it to black, Latino, that's racism. And we have to deal with it. So tell the Rahm Emanuel to imagine the citizens of Chicago, we're Jewish. Then tell me what would he do. Thank you, Ms. Thank Hunt. you. Mr. Albert Jackson. And after Mr. Albert Jackson, I'm going to have Mr. Alex ba Barba. Good evening, everyone. My name is Albert Jackson. I'm currently employed with TAS. That acronym stands for Treatment Alternatives for Safe Communities. Uh, I'm going to be brief. Normally, I don't comment. Uh, because, normally, I don't comment because I'm just walking into this forum, but I've uh, tried to keep abreast of what's been happening. I'm going to try to, my best, I'm going to, try to make it my best to get to the next one. Uh, I just want to say that it was a comment made about uh, the character of the board. 
I can speak to, uh, I, I do know several members on this particular board, and uh, uh, they're going to tell the truth, or whatever they find, they're going to reveal it. Uh, I'm a former member of the Black Panther Party, and so, uh, and you know about the relationship between the Black Panther Party, we were not a gang, uh, and the, and the uh, police departments all over the United States. Uh, at one time in my life, I was extremely anti-police. Uh, I did 25 years in prison, um, and uh, one of our members on the board, Mr. Stone, he was instrumental in gaining my release. It was something he didn't have to do, see. And uh, I've been out for 20 years uh, as a former member of the Black Panther Party when Bobby Rush purged all of us in 1970. We went back to our respective communities. As you know, our communities were flooded with heroin then. And we went back, I grew up in Argyle Gardens. We told everybody selling heroin, you got to stop. The truth never came out in my trial, but I did 25 years in prison. Had not been for Mr. Stone, I would not be here talking to you today. Since I've been out, I've, I've saved many lives. Uh, so now, having said that, um, uh, I really believe in my heart that uh, you have some people with integrity here, and they understand thoroughly what's going on. And they, I believe that whatever findings that they uh, come up with, uh, they're not going to uh, hide them. I really believe that. I can't speak to all the board, but I'm just one person talking based on my experience and what some of them do and have been doing for the last 20 years that I know of since I've been out, okay? Now, I'm gonna speed it up right quick. Um, uh, I deal with a lot of young people, people that catch cases, all uh, ethnic groups and backgrounds. For a task, I'm the orientation coordinator. Um, and, 15 uh, seconds, Mr. Okay, Jackson. We get our people from all walks, okay, just let me skip that. Um, I want to know why there, uh, oh, well, let me ask this question. Are there uh, police department policies and or procedural guidelines uh, that must be followed when police stop people? Okay? And uh, if so, are they available to the public? Many of the clients I get, they have their Fifth Amendment due process rights violated uh, because the police stopped them on pretext. Uh, and so is there something written for that? And then also, are there periodic psychological screening tools that the department use are currently in use now, and if they're not in use, what is your plan? In Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Uh, tools. Sir, Mr. Guzman will help you respond to some of your questions, particularly your, uh, your questions about access to information at the police department. Alex Barba. Alex Barba. Are you Mr. Alex Barba? No, I think he's oh, fixing the microphone. thank you, sorry. <laughs> Good evening, sir. It's on? Oh, there it goes. There we go. Um, I, I want to say good evening to all the people that showed up here today. Um, I actually went to the last task force meeting, and a lot of points were already made that I would not want to continue speaking about, but what I will speak about is if people look at their pamphlets, there's the uh, fourth item that talks about early intervention and personal concerns. But I want to address uh, the audience here today to ask the question, the police is uh, about to destroy police complaints, and I believe the, the date is set for March 15th. So how can you expect us to take this serious when you're about to destroy police records and complaints that are about, that, that are uh, in reference to the abuses that go on in our communities? So I, I find it really disturbing that you could come here today and talk about these task force when the police department is about to destroy all those complaints at the moment. Um, Sir, if I can address that. Well, there, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no date for destruction on March 15th. Okay. We specifically, let me just finish, we specifically um, took back the comments that we had heard uh, from other uh, task force public forums um, and asked the very question to the head lawyer for the city, uh, Steve Patton, who's the corporation counsel. And we expressed the concern that we had heard uh, from another speaker that there was a, a date of March 15th looming. There is no such date. There, was, there, are, there are actually two cases that are pending, and an arbitrator ruled in favor of the union, but the city is poised to appeal that, um, that ruling, and there's no impending date. The city has been on the side, frankly, the people in this one, which is deposing the FOP in its effort to try to destroy uh, police records. 
um, and I think that fight will continue, but I want to be clear, there is no impending date for the destruction of any police department records. Okay. Um, and then I'm looking at the last one where they're talking about legal oversight and accountability. Um, I work with an organization that's called FDLA, and what they do is teach young individuals their rights, and it seems that the more that these young individuals know their rights in the streets, the more abuse they receive from the police in the neighborhoods. And then once they arrive to the police stations, they are denied access to a lawyer, which is, uh, FDLA basically provides free legal services to police stations before the charges are pressed on these young individuals. So um, the, the, the police department has caught on to what's been going on in the neighborhoods in reference to the training of first defense legal aid. Mm -hmm. And what they do now is they start telling the lawyers that there's no such person at the police station, which is quite disturbing. And I wish FDLA would have showed up to actually um, to speak more about how they're being treated when they get to the police stations looking for individuals at these police stations. So, 15 seconds, Mr. Parra. So finally, if people are interested, I actually am a volunteer with the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, in which we're trying to establish an all-elected, all-civilian police accountability council that would put the people in charge of the police when it comes to the crimes to commit in our neighborhoods. Thank you. See me afterwards. Thank you, sir. Randolph, you want to? Yes. Um, uh, sir, just in response to your point about FDLA, uh, the director of FDLA is on our working group and will be making recommendations regarding the provision of police, of attorneys in police stations. So thank you for your comment. Evan Hell Yanubin, I'm sorry about that last name. Evan Hell, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Evan Hell. Mr. T.C. McCoy. Good evening again. Good evening, sir. Good to see you again. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry we have to meet like this. <laughs> it's our pleasure. Pat Hill just got up and spoke about an issue that's very important. And I want the people in here to listen to this because it's very important what we're talking about today. And it's not about some joke and it's not about people with titles like police. A policeman's title is only as good as the people who respect that title. A lawyer is as only good as the work that he do for the people that he works for. This task force was put together by Rahm Emanuel. In the year 1998, Mayor M. Richard M. Daley did another task force. After there was a police scandal on the west side of Chicago, and who led that task force was a gentleman named Dan Webb, along with Anita Alvarez. And what came out of that task force was that you now have to have a two-year college degree to catch a person that don't even have a GED. If you look at the Laquan McDonald shooting, you didn't see any black officers out there that night. You tell me, what does a two-year college degree have to do with catching a person that don't have a GED and black and Hispanic people that want to be police officers suffer because they tell you to go to school, but they tell you the schools that you go to are no good, so you drop out. So is the task force going to come up with another recommendation that you now have to have a four-year college degree to catch a person that don't have a GED so that it would eliminate all black and Hispanic people and it would only recruit black officers who really don't want to work in black communities and we'll be back here another two years from now doing the same thing we're doing now. We need to eliminate the qualifications of someone having a two-year college degree. Because when you went to the police department, when I went there, 15 seconds, Mr. You, had, McCoy. you got 30 hours of college credit. I wasn't as smart as everybody else, so when they were giving out college credits, I decided to buy me two master's degrees. But what did that have for me to do 
to catch a person that didn't have a GED. We need to eliminate the qualifications of someone having a high school, I mean a college degree, to catch a person that don't have a GED. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Eve Angel. Good evening. Good That's evening, man. Eve you, Angel Yanubian. I apologize. No problem. The problem is the mayor. <laughs> he appointed this panel to hear the pain of the people, but he doesn't listen. We told him to fight crime by fixing up abandoned buildings and create jobs. The mayor is tearing them down. He doesn't listen. He doesn't listen to the voters that put him in office. It's doubtful that he will listen to your recommendations. I have four. Support the US United States Senate Bill S-1038 in Racism Profiling Act of 2013. Enforce Illinois House Bill 63-22 that amends the Personnel Records Review Act not to delete officers' disciplinary reports, letters of reprimands, or other records of disciplinary action which are more than four years old. You can't restore trust by destroying evidence to cover up crimes of crooked cops and killer cops. Have cops sign a waiver that they cannot sue citizens for stress after they have killed people for any reason at all. Mandate officers to have annual mental health screenings to test for negrophobia and homophobia and their family violence history. Family violence has been called the most common form of terrorism and police officers occupy 40% of domestic violators, while the general public, uh, public only represents 20%. 15 seconds, ma'am. On February 11th, uh, the United, uh, Chicago became uh, a, a city for the rights of the child. They have failed in that capacity. On January 24th and 25th, the United Nations met at Chicago State and condemned Chicago for policing in schools, for a shooting of children like McCon McDonald 16 times, and uh, closing of schools. So you will be hearing from the uh, Genocide Accountability Act of 2007. Thank you, Ms. Evangel. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm going to read a comment from Adrian Hernandez. I work across the street from the YMCA Youth Safety and Violence Prevention Program. I work with multiple at-risk youth. Why is it that most, if not all of the youth I work with, tell me they don't want to go to school anymore because the police will stop and frisk them before school? They are often hit, slapped, and are often taken to different gang neighborhoods. How can I possibly encourage them to continue to go to school when they are being harassed? I'd like to ask Mr. Zachary Marshall to the microphone. Good evening. Uh, I know that the task force is uh, appointed by the mayor and, and my issue may not be that Maybe your intentions may be good. Some of you up there and you want to get things settled in the community. My issue is uh, of a different other than the shootings that's going on and a lot of brutality that police are practicing on citizens. Mine is bogus traffic stops. That people that are innocent, when you go to court, they don't want to hear what you have to say. You just automatically have to pay. Now, I don't want to understand what could be done about that because nobody represents the person. When you go to court, and the judge said, as long as the police officer is present, then you have to pay that ticket. Now, Mr. Ferguson, you said that we would be able to see something behind that. This has been going on for years. Now, I've been a, a guy that works every day. I'm 57 years old, and every time I ever went to court, I always has, has had to pay. There's been guys that are out here on the street, suspended license, everything else, broken taillights, and they go and they get off. 
My thing is, what can you do about that? Among all the other complaints that everybody else have here, maybe you should have some task force members or some people appointed to ride in those cars with those police officers and see what's really going on in the community. Can you answer that, Mr. Ferguson? You're making a suggestion that we actually ride in the communities. No, I'm saying that maybe, just like a pre people in the community have a lot of complaints, maybe you can have some people out on the street when you get these calls about uh, domestic violence in a community or a person with a gun to be on the sideline to witness their self what's actually going on in the community. You're looking at me like I'm from another planet, but for actually, no, I'm, I'm saying that I'm afraid I'm in not order for people to sit up here and say that it should be justified of what police officers do, maybe if somebody was over here with a cam, a dash cam, or a camera to record that I stopped this guy over here and I started beating his brains out and nobody saw it but the seconds, police officer. 15 seconds, Mr. Marshall. So can anything be done about that, Mr. Ferguson? Um, I don't know. You, you raise an interesting question. Um, I, I have to say, there was a gentleman earlier that said, we're not going to hear anything new tonight. That's something new, and we'll definitely uh, take it under Well, I hope somebody addresses it, because like I said, I have to go to court, take off from my job now, and I'm going to end up paying anyway, and I was innocent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Marshall. I'm going to read another comment. There have been several situations known through the media where the police officers have used unnecessary force. Example, Sandra Bland. I feel it's a disservice for police officers to throw their authority around just because they can. I feel like things need to change. They're taking lives and getting away with it. Another example is when the police have shot two innocent victims on the 5,000 block of Erie, the downstairs neighbor. Mr. John Gita. Good evening, Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. All right. Um, I think what you hear is a lot of hurt. You hear a lot of hurt. And that's sir, it. sir, do you mind, um, yeah, speak directly gotcha. into the microphone so we can all hear you. I think I'll pre preface my statements by saying that what you hear is a lot of hurt. That's the theme that's ongoing, and I'm sure you've heard it before. Um, but I do want to say that I think you had some validity in your statement when you said that on the 31st, the report would come out, right? That's right. And you, Mr. Ferguson, are the, um, you, you're supposed to have oversight over the city of Chicago, correct? Um, and you directed us, the board directed us to go to our ottoman and present our issues. You, you, you directed us to go to our ottoman and present our issues, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a bit frustrating when these same ottoman um, are not willing to grant you the power to have oversight or the city of Chicago, how are they going to listen to, to us, the citizens? And I think that's an issue of transparency that we see in government that creates a wall of deception, if you will. Um, so that's a challenge that we're asking for help. It's the help that we're asking for, but at the same time, we see what's going on in City Hall, and that's not a reflection of true transparency. So for us, I think we're here for questions that may at times be phrased as anger in a way. Um, and we are all in this together. We are all in this together. But at the same time, I think we need to have some true reflection of ourselves. So I think I'll summarize my statement by saying, well, how are we supposed to go to an ottoman, a local ottoman, when those same people that sit in those offices are not willing to grant you the power for oversight? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read a comment. The topic I'd like to discuss is the 911 operators are, are putting everyone at risk. Although this is a forum on police accountability, however, the gatekeeper to the police response is the 911 operator. In the tragedy of the Legreer case, in which a shooting death is not being called an accident like Mrs. Jones, if those operators had acted in a more professional way, they could have informed the responding officers that the caller sounded like he needed help, but they were not sure 
to what extent that tragedy could have been avoided. Hold them accountable. Let me just say, with respect to that, we are very focused on the 911 operators, call takers, and dispatchers. Um, and again, those issues uh, overlap on a lot of our working groups, but rest assured that it's something that we are taking very, very seriously and are looking into. Mr. Garrett Hitcher. Evening. Uh, Good evening, I'm sir. Here with a few of my colleagues as a representative of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. I believe we heard from David and Alejandro already. I just want to say that the turnout at every one of these forums so far is a big testament to the will of the Chicago people to solve this problem. But it's not a vote of confidence in the task force. We're sick of all of these appointed bodies. IPRA, the police board, all we have is appointments by the mayor. They're all given power because they know they'll never use it. And we want that power to go directly to the people that would be able to solve these problems. Now, someone brought up the school closings a few years back. You might remember that those closings were preceded by a very similar rotating task force that went around the city to collect people's opinions. And later we found out that the decision about the school closings had already been made. And we know that that is exactly what is going on right now. Now, we intend to solve this problem whether or not this task force does. So we need an all-elected, Community or Civilian Police Accountability Council to truly represent the interests of the people. Thank you. I have a comment. What needs to change is the way that police officers are promoted. They get paid more the more they arrest people. The more paperwork, the more overtime equals more money. They will continue to make more small arrests for one bag of weed but can't solve a murder. They won't even investigate a murder of a black or brown man. Ms. Sarah Wild. Um, thank you and hello to all community members. Um, evening, I'd like to pick up on a point that somebody made earlier about uh, the, the UN visiting Chicago, uh, and they did invi visit Chicago, the UN working group, and they were investing human rights violations. And they went around, they went around all US cities and they focused on Chicago. Uh, uh, and part of their results, one of their recommendations to solve the problem of uh, police impunity and police abuse and police murder was community control of the police. So um, we're not the only ones asking and seeing this as a real solution. So w what would community controls be? What do we say when we want an elected civilian police accountability council? This is not just some whimsical idea. It's a very real concrete ordinance that community members across black and brown communities, those mostly affected by police crime, so it's demanding. So what would it be? Well, let me tell you what's in place now in terms of our current racist impunity, police impunity system. We have IPRA, the Independent Police Review Authority. We have Internal Affairs, we have the Police Board, and we have the Mayor. And they all work to make sure that cops are not held accountable for their police crimes. As we know today, everybody's testimonies and, uh, 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 and uh, testimonies to these facts, endless, deep testimonies. So let me give you a bit of statistics to go along with those human faces. Since October the 1st, 2007, to the 31st of December 2015, 411 total shootings by Chicago police. IPRA has found all but two justified. Of the 16,000 complaints received through IPRA, and IPRA receives all complaints, it's the funnel for the complaint system. Of the 16,000 complaints received 2012 to 2013, only 0.13% resulted in the police board firing a cop. Now, I'm going to go back to the solution. So we have IPRA, Internal Affairs, the Police Board. The elected Civilian Police Accountability seconds, Council Wild. would replace all these entities and make sure that communities elect their community members to a board that not only holds police accountable for their crimes, but decides what the cops can do in their communities. This is the only real concrete solution to this problem, and I know I have faith in the communities here to organize for this. Thank you, everybody.
Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Wild. I'd like to remind anyone if you would like to speak at the podium or if your comment read, please fill out a comment card. You can raise your hand. One of the staff members will bring it around to you. I'd like to ask Ms. Celia Leventhal. Thank you. Good evening, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'd like to say that um, I've lived in Chicago for 35 years. I'm, uh, oh sure, sorry. I've lived in Chicago for 35 years. I'm a retired social worker, raised three children in the city, lived on the south side and now live on the west side. First and foremost, I am a mom. When I read or hear about these deaths, it's devastating. I'm heartbroken. I cannot sleep for days, for nights. Um, and I don't quite know what to do about it except complain. Um, I, one thing I would suggest is that um, you try to um, get volunteers from all over the community to be more involved, show them what they can do, publish a list of these peace organizations so that people who are frustrated and don't know what to do with themselves to help can find a way to do that. Um, I, um, let's see. I would like to say also that um, bad behavior in the police force doesn't happen in isolation. The, the city administration has, I believe, too many lawyers and not enough social workers. I also believe they don't have enough common sense. Um, as I've attended meetings over this last year about use of public land for private museums, um, both for the Obama Not Public Library and for the Lucas Museum, I see the destruction of what could be more parks um, and more recreational facilities for the youth in our community. We don't have that to waste. Uh, I would also like to say um, that I believe there's too much attention being paid to technology. I don't believe more tasers are necessarily a good thing. I, I think many 15 people... 15 seconds, Ms. Leventhal. Uh, pardon me? 15 seconds, please. I'll try. Um, um, sorry. <laughs> sure. Lost my train of thought. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, I think we have gr a group of people who have become trigger happy, and I don't believe that handing them tasers is ne necessarily a good way to calm that down. Um, let's see. Finally, um, since I have such a short amount of time, I'd like to say that I ask all of you in the community um, not to write off the part of the community that you are um, referring to or labeling as white people. There are many of us who, are, who would like to become involved and we want you to mobilize us. We'd like you to find a way for us, as I said before, to get us all involved. Please don't write us off. Um, we care, we may not have had our sons stopped at, every, at a stop sign for no reason, or some of the things that most, many of you have suffered, but it doesn't mean that we don't feel feel bad about it and want to build a better community. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, you, I don't have any more comment cards. Just a moment. This is a comment from Jenny Guerrero. Is it true that calls for shots fired are not included in the incidents reported in a community such as here in Pilsen? How can we get this information? Is there anyone else who hasn't had an opportunity to speak yet tonight that would like to offer a comment? I think we have one more person, Crystal Harms, Hams, Ms. Crystal, Ms. Crystal Harris, I apologize.
Good evening, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm a student at Benito Juarez, and I'm also an activist for CTU and um, the Chicago Student Union. Uh, thank you. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a rally outside of Juarez, and we started at the Thompson Center. And we had police following us all the way through, but once we got into Pilsen, there were a lot of uh, violent police officers who were yelling at the students and harassing them with arrest if they didn't uh, disperse and leave the school. And I feel as though we are being we are, I'm sorry, I just don't think we can trust the police right now. I think they need to go through a series of classes and understanding that not everybody's after them or out to hurt them and that as students we should feel as though they are protecting us rather than um, harassing us and putting our lives in danger. And that is all. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. I'm sorry? I, are you fit? I thought you were finished. I was thanking you for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who did not have an opportunity to make a comment or to write a comment? Okay. I'd like to turn it back over to Lori Lightfoot. Well, I, again, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, there were a lot of very insightful and helpful comments and suggestions for change. I want you to know that we have heard you and we will continue to hear you. If you, as I said at the beginning, if you wanted to speak but, uh, or wanted to offer a comment um, but didn't want to come up and speak, there's still an opportunity. We have plenty of staff throughout the room. Fill out a card, um, give us your comments because we do want to hear from you. I want to thank um, the uh, Benito Juarez uh, principal and school community for welcoming us here tonight and, and providing, I think, a welcoming uh, opportunity for members of the community and really for citizens from all over the city uh, to come and speak. I want to thank uh, Saul Flores uh, for moderating our discussion tonight and for La Casa Norte and Mujeres Latinas in Action for also hosting us. As I mentioned, this is our third community forum, and I know that I speak for all of us on the task force when I say that each one of us has been provided with uh, additional insight and understanding uh, from hearing your voices tonight. Everything that we hear from people all over the city and tonight uh, will be taken into consideration and will very much inform uh, the work of the task force and our final product. We certainly understand uh, some skepticism out there, but I think you'll be surprised at the work product uh, particularly the depth of our findings and our specific observations about some of the challenges that many of you um, have talked about here tonight. And we welcome the opportunity to continue engaging with you uh, and for you to um, have an opportunity to view our findings, our recommendations on March 31st. Thank you again tonight. Our next forum is actually this coming Thursday night at Sullivan High School on the north side. Thank you. And also, just to close out, let you know that if you need uh, access to any of the information regarding the website, regarding social media, regarding how to mail or email a comment, everything is on the back of your brochure. Thank you, and have a good evening. <laughs>